you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to burglary detail. Unidentified thieves start a campaign of burglaries in your city. Homes are broken into and stripped of their furnishings. There's no lead on the criminals. Your job, get them. When you compare Fatima with other long cigarettes, the difference is quality. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. If you want a long cigarette, smoke that best of all long cigarettes. Smoke extra mild Fatima. Fatima is the quality, king-size cigarette because it contains the finest Turkish Fatima is extra mild with a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. Because of its quality, its extra mildness, its better flavor and aroma, Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. Enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Because in Fatima, the difference is quality. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Smoke Fatima, the quality king size cigarette. Best of all, long cigarettes. <laughs> the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, August 3rd. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of burglary detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from the business office, and it was 9.25 a.m. when I got to room 45. Burglary detail. Did they get all the money together, Joe? Yeah, a dollar from each man in the detail. We gotta buy the gift. When's Austin gonna get married? Next Sunday. We haven't got too much time. You know why we always have to pick out the gift? Well, somebody has to do it. You got any ideas what we ought to get him? Talked to my wife over the weekend. She thinks it'd be nice if we get him something to start housekeeping with. Maybe some nice kitchenware, table lamp. Yeah, I don't know if we have enough dough for a good lamp. But maybe they might like a bedspread. You can always use them. Or maybe a nice wool blanket, huh? Mm, I don't know. Got to be careful about those personal things. What do you mean? What's personal about a blanket? Well, we don't know much about the girl Austin's going to marry. She might not need any. Excuse me. Could you tell me something? What's that? Well, what'd you want to know, little girl? Is this where you come to report about stolen things? Well, that all depends. Why don't you come on in and tell us all about it, huh? Thank you, I will. Like to sit down, little girl? I'm 12 years old. I'll stand if it's all right. All right. Now, well, would you like to tell us what's been stolen? Everything. Hmm? Everything's been stolen. We came back this morning and found it that way. Grandpa's awful mad. Mm-hmm. Maybe we better get the facts to start with. What's your name? Ruth Ann Marie Jeanette. Jeanette, is that your last name? No, Snyder. Ruth and Marie Jeanette Snyder. Did you come down here alone, Ruth? Yes, Grandpa sent me. He's awful mad. Where do you live? With Grandpa. Where's that? Over on College Avenue. Grandpa's legs bothering him. Arthritis. So he told me to come down and tell you about it. About what, man? Everything. We came back this morning on the train, and when we got home, we found everything was stolen. It's terrible. What do you mean by everything? I walked all the way over here to tell you. I'm thirsty, sir. Drinking fountain in the hall. Oh, we've got a cooler over here. Let me get you a cup. Huh? Thank you. You like a drink, Ben? Oh, no, thanks. All right, little lady. Here you are. Thank you very much. Well, would you like to tell us what it's all about? back to Los Angeles on the train this morning. We've been on a trip back to Indiana. Uh-huh. We took a taxi cab home from the station. When we got there, everything was gone. Everything but the rug in the dining room. Yeah. All the furniture, every single bit. Sofa, the chairs, my desk upstairs, the stove. Everything's been stolen. I want you to find it. You mean someone broke in while you were gone and took all your furniture. Is that what you think? No, they did. 
The lock on the back door, it was broken. They took everything but the dining room rug. That's why Grandpa's home now. Hmm? He thinks the crooks will be back. He's sitting on the rug because he says if they take that, they'll have to take him too. We'd better hurry. Yeah? Grandpa's not very big. a.m. Ben and I drove little Ruth Ann Snyder back to her home on College Avenue. It was an old-fashioned wooden frame structure, a few doors up from College Avenue and Everett Way. Ruth Ann showed us inside and introduced us to her grandfather, Mr. John H. Snyder, age 78. He told us that a year ago, he and his wife, Ruth Ann's grandmother, had come to California from Indiana and rented the house on College Avenue. The grandmother had fallen ill and passed away suddenly three weeks ago. He and Ruth Ann closed the house and took the body back to Indiana on the train for burial. On their return that morning, they found the house stripped of every piece of furniture. We checked room by room and listed the missing articles. We put in a call to latent fingerprints. Do you happen to know the serial numbers of your home appliances, Mr. Snyder? No, sir. I've lived with most of the furniture for 40 years. You get to know the things you own in 40 years. I know it was in my room, Sergeant. My desk, my table and chair, the bed, the curtains, they took everything. Well, how about the estimated value of the furniture, sir? Uh, what would you say it was worth? In dollars and cents? I don't know. What's a house full of furniture worth to anyone? Guess everybody puts their own value on their things. Yes, sir, they do. Solid walnut dining set. A wedding present. Mahogany front room table. A solid, too. It cost money in their day. All gone. Were there any liens against the furniture, sir? Uh huh, sir. Did you owe anything on the furniture? I mean, there was no trouble with the finance company or anything like that. Oh, we didn't even know what a finance company was when the wife and I was married. It was sad enough trip as it was. And Ruthie and me get here this morning, and everything's gone. All we own. Uh, Ruthie. Yes, Grandpa. Where the thieves broke in, would you show the officers, please? It's back this way. Okay. How are you and your grandfather going to make out here, Ruth? Well, Grandpa says we'll buy two cots for tonight, army surplus. There's no stove to cook on. We'll have to eat out. Mm-hmm. Maybe we'll have to go back to Indiana. Grandpa doesn't have much money. He's on a pension. Here's the back door. You see what they did to get in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Must have used a hammer and a crowbar. Smashed it clean through. You'll find the crooks, won't you, Sarge? We're going to try, Ruth. Better have the crime lab check this, huh? Yeah. How about your neighbors, Ruth? You know any of them well? I know who they are. I don't know any of them good. They're not very friendly. We'd like to ask you and your grandfather a few more questions, Ruth. All right. I don't know what I'm going to do when school starts. I stole all my stuff, even my composition tablets. I didn't have to take those. Which grade are you in, Ruthie? I was in A7. I'll be in the B8. Why would they take my school things? I don't know. You see how they got in back there? Yes, sir, we did. Uh, by any chance, did any of your neighbors know that you and Ruth here were going away? Why, well, I didn't mention it, no. Then no one kept an eye on your house while you were gone? No, I didn't think it was necessary. Might have helped. I just remember, Grandpa, Mrs. Merton. I told her we were going away. Who's that, Ruth? She runs the store down at the corner of the bird store. Yeah. She sells canaries, other kinds of birds, too. Mrs. Merton's her name stores right down the corner. You figure she's the only one who knew you'd be gone from the house for some time. Must have been the only one. All right, Mr. Snyder, we'll be back to see you later on. Here's our card. We'll see if we can't do something to help you out here. Let's see here. Friday, Romero, burglary detail. All right, thank you, boy. Ruthie will show you to the door. Yes, Grandpa. I must know. Goodbye, sir. Oh, oh, say there. Yes, sir. Guess you understand, but I'd like to apologize anyway. I just couldn't do it. What's that, sir? Offer you a chair. Ten thirty a.m. Ben and I called the Salvation Army and told them the Snyder situation. And then we went down the street to the store at the corner of Coolidge Avenue and Everett Way. The sign on the window said Mrs. Merton's Birdland, manager, Agnes Merton. We tried the door. It was locked. The cardboard clock hanging on the glass door read, be back at 1 p.m. So we went back up to College Avenue and we started ringing doorbells. 
Some of the residents on the block didn't even know the Snyders. Of those that did, only two had noticed any activity at the house during the three weeks Mr. Snyder and his granddaughter had been away. They told us that they'd seen a moving van parked in front of the house about a week before. They also saw men moving furniture from the house into the van. Neither of the two could describe the vehicle or remember its license number. 12.45 p.m. We had a cup of coffee and a hamburger, and then we headed back for Mrs. Merton's bird store. Yes, ma'am. Police officers. I have a few questions for you. Certainly. Something about birds? No, ma'am. About one of your neighbors. Oh. The Snyders? They live just up the street from me. Oh, yes, old couple. Poor Mr. Snyder passed away, you know, a few weeks ago. Yes, ma'am, we know. Now, how they have a wonderful granddaughter, Ruthie. She and I are getting to be great friends. The Snyder's having some kind of trouble? We're investigating a burglary at their house. Oh, is that <coughs> so? Now, you be quiet, Mary. You heard what I told Blackie. Just eat your food and be quiet. I guess you knew the Snyders had been away for the last few weeks. Yes, I did, but they're back. I saw Ruthie pass the window this morning. You noticed any activity around the Snyder's house since they've been gone? Well, yes, I did. And just what you noticed, Miss Merton? Well, it was uh, seven or eight days ago, I think. Some white moving truck stopped in front of their place, and the two men started moving up Snyder's furniture. Uh-huh. That was a little strange, because Ruthie hadn't told me anything about moving, and... In fact, she said definitely she and her grandpa were coming back after poor Mrs. Snyder's funeral in Indiana. Did you investigate it all, ma'am? Oh, excuse me. Who was that? You, Fred? Yes, you ought to be ashamed. You can see I'm busy. Another outburst like that, and all three of you, Fred, Blackie, Mary, I'll take care of you. Oh, who was I? You saw the moving van in front of the Snyder's. Oh, yes, and, um... I went up to the moving men and asked them if the Snyders were going back to Indiana. Well, of course, they didn't know anything about it. Did you inquire at the Snyders' house? Well, no, it so happened I didn't. I was on my way to one of the big aviaries in the valley, and I just didn't have time to stop. How about the moving van? Did you happen to notice the license? I don't remember the numbers. Any identifying marks about the truck you might remember? Maybe a sign on the side? Yes, the side of the truck was painted white, and there was large blue lettering on it, van and storage. It said I remember that much. Was that all? Well... Yes, as I said, I was in a hurry. I had to pick up three sick canaries out in the valley. Is there anything else about the incident you can remember? Anything at all? Mm, no, I'm afraid not. Well, thank you very much, Miss Merton. Here's our card if you happen to come across any further information. Yes, all right. I'll have to go see the Snyders. Maybe I can help. Fine. Goodbye, ma'am. Thank you very much. Yes, goodbye. Goodbye. Right. Well, now you stop up this minute. Well... Well, not much help there. Not much. Give me an idea, though. Hmm? Wedding present for the Austins. Yeah? Maybe a couple of canaries? In a nice cage? Five p.m. We went back to the office. Reports had come in from two more victims. That night, Ben and I drove out to interview them. The circumstances of the theft and the M.O. of the criminals matched identically with the Snyder case. Both of the families victimized had gone off on vacations and neglected to notify either the neighbors or the patrolmen in their area. Both had allowed daily newspapers to collect on their doorsteps in their absence and otherwise left signs that their homes were vacant. In both cases, the thieves had forced an entrance through a back door or window, stripped the house of every last piece of furniture, and either hauled it away themselves or hired somebody to do it for them. We started canvassing the two areas where the crimes had been reported. Again... The neighbors saw the moving vans, but none were able to definitely identify the vehicles or their license numbers. Captain Fulton called us into his office. You're going to have to try harder. I know they're hard to get, but get them. Get them fast. We've done about everything we can so far, Skipper. Only one small lead. The thieves seemed to be using a different moving van on each job. We started to check the movers around town, the transfer company. Leighton Prince come up with anything yet? No, no luck there. Well, the lousiest rackets we've had since I came on this detail. Whole house full of furniture, everything a family owns. Yeah. Well, we'll stay on top of it. The stats office may come up with something. How about an outlet for all that stuff that's been stolen? Thieves can't be sitting on it. Pawn shop and second-hand details have been alerted. They're checking regular outlets, auction houses, second-hand places, nothing yet. About some kind of preventive idea. At least slow them down. Good dose of publicity on the whole thing would help. If only people wouldn't keep it a secret when they're going away. Neighbors aren't alerted. That's why a lot of them didn't think much of it when they saw the moving vans parked those houses. And drawn blinds and the newspapers on the doorsteps didn't help much either. It's an open invitation. Well, I'll see what we can do on the publicity end. We've had one campaign on this already. No, excuse me. 
Burglary, Captain Fulton. Hmm. Well, what's the address? Okay, I got it. Thank you. Here you go, another one. Hmm? 63 hours, just call it in. Family back from vacation. Furniture all gone. Here's the address here. Thank you. Better get on it right away. Let's go. I'll have a little more help for you on this tomorrow. Crowley and Barnes will be free. They can work with you. Okay, Skipper. Check you later. All right. Sergeant Friday? Yes, ma'am. You remember me, don't you, Mrs. Merton? Oh, sure. The bird store. Yes, ma'am. How are you? They told me to wait here. I guess everything will be all right now. Yeah? I saw it today on Olive Street. Here. Hmm? The truck that came to Snyder's house. That's the license number. You are listening to Dragnet, the case history of a police investigation presented in the public interest by Fatima Cigarettes. It's amazing how many long cigarette smokers are changing to extra mild Fatima. Here is the actual report. From coast to coast, Fatima has more than doubled its smokers. Here is the reason why. When you compare Fatima with other long cigarettes, the difference is quality. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Fatima is the quality king-size cigarette because it contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos, superbly blended. And Fatima is extra mild, with a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. And because of its quality, its extra mildness, its better flavor and aroma, more and more smokers say it's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. I agree, says Dick Highland, sports columnist. I agree, says Mrs. Dean Taylor, painter and theatrical designer. I agree, says Frank Fenton, author. Yes, all agree. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Best of all, long cigarettes. Because in Fatima, the difference is quality. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Smoke Fatima, the quality king-size cigarette. Tuesday, August 11th, 6 p.m. The license number which Mrs. Merton had given us was checked through DMV. We found that the truck was registered in the name of a local second-hand furniture dealer by the name of Ralph Grismore. We checked his name through the police commission and then the Eye Bureau. He had a good reputation, no criminal record. Early the next morning, we picked up Mr. Snyder and his granddaughter, Ruth, and we drove to Grismore's second-hand furniture store. We identified ourselves and asked to look at his buy book. Under the date of July 27th, Grismore had recorded the purchase of more than three dozen articles of furniture from a house on College Avenue. The address was that of the Snyders. A man and a woman, Sergeant, they said they'd sold their house and they were going east. man said the company he worked for transferred him to Boston. Told me he had to get back to take over his new job. Would you recognize the people if you saw them again, Grismo? Sure, I think so. The woman was a great talker. She said they figured on selling the stuff piece by piece. They'd get more, but since they had to leave town the next day, she decided to sell the whole lot to a dealer. You got the furniture for a pretty low price, didn't you? Ooh, pretty good price, yeah. That's why I went along in a fast deal. Wasn't going to talk myself out of a bargain. They wanted to sell fast, so I wanted to buy. I didn't think anything was wrong. Sergeant. Yeah, Mrs. Snyder. I was in the dining room, sir. That's it right over there. You sure, Mr. Snyder? The cigar burned on top, just above one of the legs. No it anywhere. Uh, seems to me that's our mahogany table. I'll look. Sergeant. Miss Hayden, my best here. They're right here. My school's too. All right, Ruthie. Yeah, they sure stuck me all right. That's the last fast deal I ever make. How did they contact you, Grismore? What kind of approach did they use? Called me on the phone, and I came out and gave them an appraisal on the stuff. Nothing suspicious about either the man or the woman. Isn't that so? She was in a house dress, bandana around her head. The guy was in old clothes, just as homely as you please. Looked like he was doing a little repair work around the house, you know. Mm-hmm. You notice that they had a car parked by the house? Well, no, as a matter of fact, I didn't. There uh, wasn't any in the driveway. Mm-hmm. No argument over the price you offered them for the furniture? No. They seemed to hesitate a little, but they took my first offer. I thought I had a good deal. I don't know. How'd they react after you agreed on a price? In a hurry? Mm, said they had to board the train that night for Boston. They asked me to get the furniture out right away. Mm-hmm. The woman said they had other business to wind up, so if they weren't at the house when I came back with the van, why, she'd leave the back door open for me. I guess you realize they were going to have to place a hold on this furniture that you bought. Yeah, I know. I got nobody to blame but myself. 
And you gave this man and woman a check for the full amount of the sale. Is that right, Grismer? $550 down the drain. Do you have the canceled check? No, not yet. If you like, you can probably get it from the bank. Don't imagine those crooks would waste any time cashing. Mm -hmm. We'd appreciate it if you'd run down to the bank with us now. Okay, sir. Sergeant, could I speak with Mr. Grismer? Sure, Mr. Snyder. Uh, Mr. Grismer. Yes, sir. I'm I'm sorry about all this. I I didn't know. Oh, I understand, sir. Uh, You buy furniture, don't you? Yes, sir. Uh, What could you give me for two army surplus cots? Grismore made arrangements to round up Mr. Snyder's furniture and ship it back to his home. Then we took him down to his bank where he recovered the canceled check for $550. The endorsement read, Mr. Thomas Butterworth. According to the bank teller who waited on them, the suspect had cashed the check shortly after the sale of the Snyder's furniture. From the second-hand dealer and the clerk at the bank, we got a complete description of the man and woman known as Mr. and Mrs. Butterworth. We also had photostatic copies made of the check and specimens of the handwriting from the endorsement. From the descriptions, we checked the suspects through the stats office. We got nowhere. During the next two weeks, we found six more second-hand dealers who had been taken in on the same furniture deal. The description of the man and woman matched, and so did the handwriting and the endorsements on each check. There was only one variation. The couple went under a different name on each occasion. Wednesday, August 26th, 9 a.m., Twelve well, cases like this today, is that right? That's it, Captain. Got the description, M.O. handwriting. Still can't reach him. Well, Speeds have been freewheeling for a month now. What's going to take to stop him? Well, ben came up with a pretty good idea this morning. We'd like to talk it over with you. Oh, what's that? Kind of a system of decoy, Skipper. We were thinking it might be a good idea to contact all the division captains and have them ask their men if they have any neighbors going on vacation. Yeah, I'll go ahead. Well, if we've got a few dozen houses spotted around the city, we could plant a few things. Make them look obviously vacant. We'd keep the houses covered at all times. They ought to make pretty good bait for those thieves. Uh-huh. How would you set it up? Mm, we could make arrangements to get a key to each home, keep the milk and paper deliveries coming, let them pile up on the doorstep. We could reimburse the people for whatever it costs. We're not making any headway. We could run this for a couple of weeks, see what happens. Mm-hmm. What do you think? Try it. contacted all division commanders requesting them to ask their men to contact burglary detail if they knew of any of their neighbors about to leave on a vacation. During the next two days, the response came in and the plan went into effect. Forty homes throughout the city were spotted as decoys. They were kept under surveillance at all times. In the week that followed, two more burglaries of the same type were reported, but the suspects failed to try any of the decoy homes. The men in the pawn shop and second-hand details continued to work right along with us. The stolen furniture kept turning up, but not the thieves. Again, the homes that had been broken into displayed all the usual signs that the occupants were away. Old circulars and newspapers scattered on the lawn. Milk bottles lined up at the door, all the blinds drawn. The decoy plan continued. No results. August 31st, we had a report of another burglary involving the theft of furniture. We made our investigation. 2 p.m. We went back to the office to get out a list of stolen articles. Hi, Ben. Joe. Hi, Austin. When did you get back from your night moon? Late last night. Say, so Thelma and I'd sure like to thank all you fellas for that wedding present you sent us. Darn nice of you. Well, we're glad you liked it, Austin. Sure, beauty. I'd like to ask you a question about it, though. I hope you won't take it wrong. No, go ahead. Well, what is it? You've got an early American house, haven't you? Yeah, that's right. It's an antique. Yeah? It's an apple peeler. When the first ever bill. Oh, sure. Thanks a lot. I get it. Burglary Friday. Yeah? Where? Right away, thanks. One of the decoy houses. Yeah? We got a bite. Together with Sergeants Crowley and Austin, we drove out to the decoy house where an unidentified man and a woman had been seen forcing entry through a back door. They'd been spotted by a police officer's wife who lived next door and who had called in the report. We parked down the street from the decoy home and waited. Five minutes passed. We saw a woman dressed in a house coat come out onto the porch of the house, look up and down the street, and then go back inside. A few minutes after that, a gray Chevrolet sedan pulled up in front of the house. A man in a dark suit got out and entered through the front door. Ben called communications for a make on the car. 80K to control four. 80K to control four. Request DMV on 6 Mary 6778. Repeat 6M 6778. Information urgent. 
Roger, AK, AMA 367. We waited. There were no signs of activity from the decoy house. Two minutes after Ben put in the call, we got our make on the gray sedan. Drove for the 80K. 80K, go ahead. Six, Mary, 6778. 6M6778 six, is registered to the Donahoe Furniture Company. Legal, the same. 7811 Harvard Boulevard. It is a Chevrolet Deluxe two door sedan, 1941 model. Engine number C6BA4414. 80K, Roger. KMA367. A few minutes after the call back, a moving van drove down the street and backed into the driveway of the decoy house. The sign on the side of the van read Donahoe Furniture Company. Two men got out, went up to the front door, and were let in. They came out in a couple of minutes and loaded a sofa into the moving van. Okay, you. Crowley and Austin get the sign. Yeah, here they come. Well, let's go. Hey, uh, you and Crowley want to cover the back, Austin? Right. Let's go, Crowley. Yeah. Come on, Ben. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir, you want something? Police officers like... Come on, the cops! Run out! Stand still, you. <laughs> Austin and Charlie got her. All right, hold still, mister. Oh, hold still. Hey, what's this all about, you cops? That's right. And you? Max Donahoe, I'm buying this lot of furniture. Something the matter? You're buying from the wrong people. They're not the owners. You better have your men move that stuff back in the house. Okay, if you say so. <laughs> All right, lady, relax. Uh, take it easy, Helen. There's no use fighting. They got us. You told it. I told you luck doesn't last forever. Okay, all right. Don't make it worse. All right, let's go. I'll take her, Austin. You better fix your shirt. Yeah. Come on, lady. Let your hand. Hey. What's the matter with your shirt, Austin? What? Yeah, used to happen when she tried to get away. Yeah, lipstick all over the collar there. Doesn't look very good. No, it doesn't. What are you going to tell your new bride? I got nothing to hide. I'll tell her the truth. Yeah? She'll believe me. Won't she? The story you just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On November 25th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 87, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. And now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you. Under our system of law, the jury selected to hear a case is accorded complete freedom. The jury's decision is the final result of the testimony and evidence presented in the course of the trial. So, with Fatima, they are the final result of carefully selecting and blending only the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos to make Fatima extra mild. If you're a long cigarette smoker like I am, buy a pack of Fatimas and compare them with other long cigarettes and you'll see the difference is quality. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. So, smoke Fatima. <laughs> The suspects were identified as Mr. and Mrs. Thomas Dunbar. They were arraigned on 15 counts of burglary and tried and found guilty on all counts. They are now serving their terms in the state penitentiary. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice came from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, the best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet from Los Angeles. Coming up, Duffy's Tavern. Bob Hope returns October 3rd on NBC. NBC.